So this is problem number six from the 2019 AP Calc AB for your response set. Non-calculator question, uh, pretty tough in my opinion. So if we look at the setup, they talk about three different functions, f, g, and h. They tell us they're all twice differentiable. And think about what differentiability implies. If a function is differentiable, it's got to be continuous. And, and that's a fact that we're going to use a little bit later on within some of the pieces of this. Uh, but f, g, and h are twice differentiable. And they tell us that g of 2 and h of 2 both equal 4. They tell us that this line's equation, and this is kind of a weird form. You've probably seen this in calculus when you do linear approximations. But if you want to turn it into point-slope form, you can just subtract the 4 from the y. right? So y minus 4 equals and then 2 thirds times the quantity x minus 2. So it has this ordered pair, 2 comma 4 on it, and then it has a slope of 2 thirds. Uh, it says that that line is tangent to both the graphs of g and h at the x value of 2. So if you look at what part a asks us to do, if you understood what we just kind of discussed as we ran through that problem statement, part a is actually pretty easy. Uh, it asks us to find h prime of 2. So we just need to realize that since this graph is tangent to h at the x value of 2, the slope of this line corresponds to h prime of 2. And the slope of this line is 2 thirds. And, and it's as simple as that in part a. Part b isn't too bad. Um, part b says to let a be some new function. So this new function is 3x cubed times h of x. And we don't really know what h of x is. We have a little bit of information about h of x, but we technically don't even know what h of x is. Asks us to write an expression for a prime of x, and then also for a prime of 2. So when you're going for a prime of x, you need the derivative of this. And hopefully you look at this and you realize that it's a product between a function you know, 3x cubed, and a function you don't necessarily know, h of x. So you're going to have to use a product rule to take that derivative. So I have the derivative of the first portion of the product times the original second portion of the product, adding on to that the original first portion of the product times the derivative of the second piece of the product. So hopefully you understand where that comes from. Uh, so there's a prime of x, and then we want to find a prime of 2. So we've got to toss 2 in place of all the x's. So this x, this x, this x, this x. All are going to have 2 go in place of them. So that's what you see. Whoa, I have a mistake here. Sorry about that. If you notice what I changed, I, I inadvertently changed this exponent from a 3 to a 2 when I was doing my annotations a little bit earlier. So I just fixed that up and, and got the correct answer here. So back to where we were, we tossed 2 in place of all of these x's. And we have to realize that h of 2 is given to us as 4. And h prime of 2, that's what we found back in part a. That's the slope of this tangent line. That's 2 thirds. Uh, and this right here, this line right here would receive full credit. You don't even have to apply any of the exponents or order of operations to pieces like this. You do have to get numerical values in place of h of 2 and h prime of 2. Uh, but if you take it to the end result here, you end up with 160. Part C is the first part that I would classify as, as pretty tricky. Uh, they tell us that h satisfies this equation. And so now we see f of x sneak into this problem for the first time. So f of x is in this denominator, and it's being subtracted from 1 after it's cubed. So the way that f of x makes its way into this problem isn't really that nice. They tell us that we know that the limit as, h approach, as, as x approaches to for h of x can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule. So if, if you take a minute to just think about what that means, in order to find this limit, we're going to have to have either 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity in order to be able to apply L'Hopital's rule. And we're going to use that trait in just a minute or two. We want to use the limit as we approach 2 on h of x to figure out what f of 2 and f prime of 2 are. And then we're asked to show the work that leads to our answers. So I, I read this and I thought, all right, I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to see if I can check this limit. So they, they tell me that h of x is equal to this if I don't equal 2. So as I'm approaching 2, I'm not necessarily equaling 2, so I can replace h of x with this. So the limit as I approach 2 for h of x is the limit as I approach 2 for this fraction. And if I put 2 in place of the x's in that fraction, you end up with what I have written right here. 
Now, if L'Hopital's rule is necessary to use to figure out the, the answer to this limit, I see the numerator pretty clearly is a zero. My denominator must also equal zero if L'Hopital's rule is going to be necessary to use to find the answer to this limit. So what that implies is that this denominator also has to equal zero. And if this denominator is equal to zero, one and whatever's being subtracted from it have to equal each other. So f of two cubed has to equal one. Well, if I take the cube root of one, I still get one. And that tells me what f of two is. So kind of weird way that we're finding f of two. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and then if we proceed, we, we also want to find f prime of two. So f prime of two isn't present anywhere in this initial calculation. So now we actually want to go ahead and carry out L'Hopital's rule. So since we have zero over zero now, we can go ahead and do the rate of change of the top of the limit. So rate of change of x squared minus four is two x, rate of change of the bottom, uh, derivative of that is zero, and then I'm subtracting off the derivative of this term from zero. So this is gonna require a chain rule. Multiply by the exponent, subtract one from it, leave the inner function inside of that multiplied by the derivative of the inside function. So there's how f prime makes its way into the work. We're still checking the limit as we approach two. So if I put two in place of my x's after doing my rate of change of the top and rate of change of the bottom, you end up with this expression right here. We know what f of two is from what we just said on the top half of the screen. This is just a one. So this is really just negative three times one squared times f prime of two. So we've got four over negative three f prime of two. So now you see that I set this limit equal to four. So how did I know that this limit had to equal four? Well, we said early on that since h is twice differentiable, h is continuous. So since h is continuous, I know the limit as I approach two on h has to equal whatever h of two equaled. So that's how I know the answer to the limit already without necessarily being able to work it out directly from L'Hopital's rule. But if I know that this L'Hopital's rule expression has to equal that function value due to the continuity of h at two, I can go ahead and multiply the right-hand side by this denominator. I can divide by negative 12, uh, reduce that fraction, you get negative one-third for f prime of two. So hopefully it makes sense. Definitely kind of a, a, a tricky part of this question. And we're about to discuss one more tricky piece to problem number six here. So now in part D, tells us that g of x is less than or equal to h of x for the entire stretch of the x-axis from one to three. Another function comes in, k. That's a function satisfying this inequality. So we've already stated that g of x is less than or equal to h of x on this interval, and now they're sandwiching k of x in between g of x and h of x for that entire stretch of x values that we just were talking about. Question ultimately is, is k continuous at x equals two? Justify your answer. So I, I used an argument that we mentioned as we read the problem statement early on, and that's since h and g are differentiable, we know they're continuous. So h and g don't have anything weird happening with them on the stretch of the graph from one to three. Um, there's not going to be a hole, there's not going to be a jump, there's not going to be any asymptotes on either the graph of h or g. So why is that significant? Well, that tells us that the limit as we approach 2 on g of x equals g of 2, right? The definition of continuity is that the limit as you approach it has to exist, the function value has to be defined, and those two things have to equal each other. And we know what they're going to equal. They're going to equal 4. Similarly, since h is continuous, we know that this has to be true as well. The limit as we approach 2 on h has to exist h of 2 has to be defined, and those two things have to equal each other. And since they tell us the answer to h of 2 and g of 2 in the problem statement, we know that all of these things have to equal 4. If k is continuous at 2, those same things have to happen. The limit as we approach 2 on k has to exist, k of 2 has to be defined, and those two calculations have to equal each other. So if we use the inequality, g of x is less than or equal to k of x is less than or equal to h of x, if I analyze the limit 
on the left, on the right, in the middle. Right? So I'm basically applying the same operator to each portion of the inequality. I know the answer to the left-hand side of that sandwich inequality. I know the answer to the right-hand side of that sandwich inequality. If the left-hand side has an answer of 4, the right-hand side has an answer of 4, the only thing that the middle can be, if it's got to be sandwiched in between the two, is that same value. And that is actually called the sandwich theorem. So that's probably something you've dabbled with a little bit in calculus. Uh, you don't necessarily have to reference that. You know, it, it follows from the continuity of f and of g and h rather that this limit has to be four. So we've we've now checked one box, right? The limit as we approach two on k of x has to exist. What about the function value? Well, if we do the same thing, you know, g of x is less than k of x is less than h of x. Well, if I plug 2 in place of all of those x's, that inequality still has to be satisfied. I know g of 2 is 4 due to the continuity of g. I know h of 2 is 4 due to the continuity of g and the fact that they provide us with that value. And this has to be sandwiched in between the two. So the only value that this one can be in order for this inequality to make sense is that k of 2 is also going to have to equal 4. So one more time, that's an application of the sandwich theorem but that checks the other box that we needed to check for the continuity of k. We are defined at 2. Moreover, the limit was 4, the function value is 4, those two calculations equal each other, and that's the, the, la the final box that needs to be checked. Three boxes need to be checked. Limit has to exist, function has to be defined, those two calculations have to equal each other. So yeah, we are continuous at x equals 2.